Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual conference titled Venezuela on the Brink, IMF to the Rescue. My name is Casey Stelter, and I am the Program Associate here at the Bretton Woods Committee. I would like to thank our global audience in attendance, especially all of our Bretton Woods Committee members, as well as our esteemed speakers for joining us today. This program is part of our Regional Spotlight Series, which aims to evaluate critical economic, development, and trade issues affecting key countries and regions across the globe. Today, we will examine causes of the economic and political crisis in Venezuela, the regional and global ramifications of the instability, and the appropriate role for the international financial institutions and global community in responding. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. The orange arrow icon pictured here allows you to collapse and expand the control panel. By default, you have joined the presentation's audio using your computer speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Please note that if you join via telephone, you will not have the ability to pose questions during the Q&A portion. If you have a question, please type them into the Questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the virtual conference. We will collect these and call on individuals during the Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Currently, all participants are in listen-only mode as indicated by the muted icon in the middle of your control panel. During the Q&A portion of the presentation, we will unmute individual lines so you can pose questions to the speakers. When you are called upon, you will need to ensure that you click the microphone icon to unmute yourself from your end as well. Your microphone icon on your control panel will turn green when your microphone is enabled. Finally, you may view today's virtual conference in full screen mode by clicking the blue square on the control panel. I would now like to briefly introduce our speakers. We have with us Ms. Meg Lunsiger, who is a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and currently consults on international economic, financial, and regulatory issues. Prior to this position, she served as the United States Executive Director on the International Monetary Fund Executive Board and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Trade and Investment at the U.S. Treasury. We also have with us Mr. Francisco Toro, a Venezuelan journalist, political scientist, and blogger who currently serves as the Executive Chairman of the Caracas Chronicles and a contributing columnist for the Washington Post. Previously, he has reported for the New York Times and the Financial Times and was editor of English language content at Then Economy. Mr. Toro has published a range of topics regarding the politics and economics of Venezuela and Latin America. Finally, Dr. Robert Kahn will be moderating our conversation today. Dr. Kahn is an adjunct professorial lecturer at American University's School of International Service and an economic consultant. He was previously at the Council on Foreign Relations and More Capital Management, served as a senior advisor in the Financial Policy Department at the World Bank, and held senior staff positions at the IMF, U.S. Treasury, and U.S. Federal Reserve. Thank you very much to our speakers for joining us today. And Dr. Khan, I will now turn it over to you to tell our audience a little bit more about today's discussion. Woods Committee. Uh, hello, everybody. I want to thank Casey and the Bretton Woods Committee for hosting this call. It's extraordinarily timely, and we have uh, two great speakers. So I will be brief and, and get over to them. What I thought I'd do today is start with Francisco. I think he's a must read for those of you who are uh, intent on following the situation in Venezuela closely. He's going to give us a good sense of where we are and what are the forces at play and forces for change. And then I'll bring Meg into the conversation to talk a little bit about the public policy response, drawing on her experience on many sides of the table here and involved in rescues in the past, although maybe uh, one of my questions will be the, uh, whether she's ever dealt with anything as complicated and complex as we are facing now. Uh, so we, we'll have some conversation among ourselves, and I want to leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A with the audience. So thank you all for dialing in. Uh, with that, let me turn uh, to Francisco uh, to lead us off. You know, it, it, this is an extraordinary catastrophic ep economic and 
and social crisis, uh, the sort I certainly haven't seen. Uh, tell us where we are and where you think we're going. Well, thank you, and thank you to the Bretton Woods Committee for this. I think to start, um, I've gotten really obsessed with this uh, story that came out on Venezuelan social media last week about this uh, Metro de Caracas worker. So this is a subway worker in Caracas who his uniform, his work uniform was dirty. And so he needed to launder it. So he goes to the store to try to buy some laundry detergent and realizes that the price of the laundry detergent is now more than his pay packet for two weeks work. Uh, and so he's like, look, I, I can't go to work. I can't work like this because my, you know, my uniform is dirty and I can't afford to get it laundered. Um, it's just one story, but it shows something much wider in the Metro de Caracas. The people who have been tracking absenteeism and people not turning up to work in, in the Metro now find that depending on the day and depending on the station, something between 40 and 75% of Metro workers just are not turning up to work. And that happens for a couple of reasons. Um, a, they can't be fired under Venezuelan labor law. It doesn't matter if you don't turn up to work, they still have to pay you and they can't fire you. Uh, the union certainly wouldn't allow it. And B, more importantly, they can't afford to work for the kinds of wages that they're getting. Uh, minimum wage now, and few people in Venezuela are too far off from minimum wage. Minimum wage amounts to about five cents, five US cents a day uh, at the parallel market exchange rate. Now, why has this happened? This has happened because Venezuela is now the first hyperinflation of the 21st century uh, in the Western hemisphere. Uh, other generations of Latin Americans have, have lived through episodes like this in Bolivia and Brazil and Argentina. People saw things like this in the 1970s and 80s, but Latin America hasn't seen anything like this in the last generation. And there's a difference between what's happening in Venezuela and what's happened to other places, which is that in other places, often you had periods of persistent high inflation that would last a year or a couple of years with inflation of 5% a month, 10% a month, 11% a month. And then the unions would adapt, the, the way they would react is that they would demand wage indexing. They would say, well, you know, if inflation, if prices rose 7% last year, you have to raise my salary seven, uh, last month. You have to give me a countervailing cost of living adjustment this month. And that was self-defeating, sure, because it, it fed into the spiral and it fed expectations of ever higher inflation and, and brought hyperinflation about, but at least it kept some kind of proportionality between the purchasing power of what workers were taking home and the costs in the store. In Venezuela, there hasn't been any move towards indexing and there couldn't be a move towards indexing because there's no index. The government doesn't publish inflation statistics. They've been held like a, as a state secret for over a year now. Other like the opposition led National Assembly publishes something, but it's not official. So if, if you wanted to index, it's not clear what you'd index against. But the reality is that with no indexing, you've seen hyperinflation outstrip the purchasing power of wages and, and lag behind the loss in value of the Bolivar to, to an extreme degree. Now, five cents a day is not a reasonable wage for anybody. Now, um, in a way, what does, what does this really mean? Okay, nobody can survive on five cents a day. So people don't go to work because they need to hustle for side income. A lot of people, a lot of guys are telling us, look, if I make a thermos of coffee in the morning and I go out on the streets and I hawk it one cup at a time, I will make much more than I can make working at the Metro. So people, they keep drawing their salary, but they're hawking coffee in the, in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, it also means that even then it's really not enough. So you're dependent on state food deliveries to your home. Uh, in order to eat. So people are sitting at home waiting for the government to send them food. And this becomes a very powerful political tool because the government now decides if you eat or not. And if you're not politically loyal enough, you understand that you're putting at risk your access to food. Um, but mostly, I think that the real question for me and the strategic question from the, from the story of absenteeism is what happens when you reach some kind of critical threshold where there just are not enough people were coming to the metro for the metro to work at all. How do people move around the city? And then when you brought enough from the metro and you look at the entire public sector and much of the private sector too, what happens when nobody can afford to work in the entire economy? These are questions I don't know how to answer. And I've struggled to think of a historical parallel for a situation this dire. Uh, and on that happy note, I'll hand it back.
Let me jump in and, and push you a little bit in a couple of dimensions. So you're describing, I think it's fascinating, as, as I'm someone who studied indexed hyperinflation, driven hyperinflation, and this idea that the lack of indexation is essential to what we're seeing now in terms of the breakdown of supply chains and really the capacity of the economy to produce. Uh, so we're seeing this rising absenteeism really across critical sectors. Let me ask you in particular to drill down on two sectors of importance. One is energy. Right, because as we all know, uh, the energy sector and PDVSA's capacity to produce is at the core of generating resources to sustain this government. And we have seen a very sharp decline in production uh, and exports of the, of the country. Uh, we, they essentially turned over PDVSA to the military. Uh, a few months ago, the military made a commitment to reopen rigs, and we see them reopening rigs, but the production continues to decline. Is this kind of sense of this breakdown of productive capacity part of the story of PDVSA as well? And what does it tell you looking forward for the resources that are going to be at the control uh, of the government? Absolutely, absolutely. And in PDVSA, it's been really serious, mostly in the, uh, in the level of um, technical staff and people who have some training and some skills to work an oil rig or to, to do the more specialized jobs in the oil industry. They're, they're also getting paid six, seven cents a day. So a lot of those guys are leaving for Colombia, but the breakdown in productive capacity doesn't just come from the labor absenteeism. It comes from the whole panoply of things like crime at production sites. You cannot open a, a drilling rig in the Faja del Orinoco overnight because gangs will come and rob your workers blind. Uh, supplies, um, there are some rigs that haven't been able to open just because there's no steel rebar, which PDVSA was supposed to supply under the contract. PDVSA doesn't have rebar, you can't do it. Rigs usually run on diesel and there is no lubricant, there's no motor oil for, for diesel engines or for any kinds of engines. So you have rigs that are shut down. You know, Quevedo, the new PDVSA president may be under orders to run the rig, but if there's no motor oil to run the rig, you can't run it. So all of these things sort of uh, feed back on each other and then you get to, you know, from, you get to absurd anecdotes and I understand that they're anecdotes, but they give you just a feel of what it's like to try to run an oil industry in this sense. One contractor um, was telling us that they had a meeting in Puerto La Cruz scheduled with PDVSA people with, uh, at PDVSA headquarters in Puerto La Cruz. And the day they arrived to the meeting, a shipment of shampoo was delivered to the pharmacy just down the street. And nobody had seen shampoo in the shops in a month or two. And nobody had shampoo at home. So all of the, the, the office just emptied out. Everybody went to stand in line for shampoo. And they're like, well, we just traveled here for a meeting. That will not happen because everyone we're supposed to be meeting is lining up for shampoo. So written about the, that these forces are, are creating, are leading to a, to a deeper collapse in the financial system. And we're likely to see stories, increasing stories of uh, the government having to intervene in the banks. Uh, is that part of, you know, a critical issue for you to watch? And is that something that is going to be a, you know, uh, part uh, a potential fracture point for this government. That's one of several. Um, there were a series of extraordinary meetings between the bank su superintendent, who is a lieutenant colonel in the army, I believe, or the navy, who has no background in finance, and the banking federation. Four out of the five days last week, they were meeting in in emergency sessions. Um, some of the leaks we heard from those meetings were quite alarming. There are no banks that are at low risk now. They cannot keep up with the rate of money creation. So there is this uh, disintermediation phenomenon where people just, uh, banks just can't lend fast enough at the rate that money is being created. And there's also a problem with dollar balance sheets in the banks because a lot of the banks were participating in this kind of shadow finance operation where they were taking uh, deposits in dollars in the Venezuelan banking system, and they were investing them in PDVSA bonds and Venezuela bonds. And we saw what happened to those asset prices last year. So those balance sheets are in big trouble. And that is one of many, many crisis points that, that, that could set off an even deeper crisis. Some, some people say that, you know, having a bank crisis in the middle of hyperinflation is a bit like having a gas leak and explosion in the middle of a nuclear, of a nuclear attack. Like this is, would normally be bad but you got fake bigger fish to fry. I, I don't know how to think about these things. So, does the, so you've described, an econ, you know, to us uh, economists, you've described an economy really in full-fledged collapse. 
uh, a government that's going to have only the response of rapid money creation and explosion, continued explosion of prices. We see in the, the black market rate, which I think has lost about half its value in the last month. And I saw today was um, 241,000 to the dollar, uh, which is extraordinary. Um, so that if, if economics was determinative, this would be the end of the story. And yet, of course, the politics uh, aren't. Or aren't where, where do you see the politics going in the context of this? And also, what is the, what's going to be the military's response to this uh, situation? Well, to start with the last part, the military is in a very curious position because they're the only sector of the economy where you can't use – where workers or soldiers in this case cannot use absenteeism as an escape valve because then you're absent without leave and that's a crime you end up in jail so those guys do have to keep showing up to work and earning seven eight ten cents a day um and watch your families go hungry to what extent that is sustainable the, the reports that i hear about discontent in the ranks are fairly dire that doesn't mean that there's a conspiracy afoot or anything like it but it does mean that it's very difficult to keep discipline when you have a bunch of guys in the barracks who know that their families are going hungry because they're stuck here uh that on the one hand and i forgot the the beginning part of your question well you have a fracture you have a fractured opposition right. and some discussion about the possibility of elections I mean, you know, I, there were people last year maybe ta hoping for a kind of color revolution and we'd have this sort of grand political transition. Those hopes seem dashed. But, uh, you know, what is the potential for uh, some sort of re re change in the regime or some coalescence of opposition forces? Well, we we gave we gave the color revolution thing a try. It didn't go great for us. Um, I have a friend, uh, Rafael Lucia, who's a wonderful writer, who has this nice quip about how that only thing that the regime now really controls is the opposition. That's the only thing they control. They, the opposition has become subject to a very sophisticated infiltration and influence campaign over the last year, such that everybody in the opposition who is out on the street and is not either exiled or in jail or under house arrest or under a medida substitutiva, basically on parole, are out there because they are not a threat to the government. Um, people get, we've seen the government do things like take political figures, important political figures, put them in prison in unbearable sort of dungeon-like circumstances and then tell them, well, you can come out, but you can come out only if you do what we say, like stand for election, for municipal election, then you can come out. We've seen that. That's created a huge amount of bad blood in the opposition and distrust because if you're out and you're free, you're suspect, you have been compromised. That is the reason you're free. So. So the government controls the opposition, but that's the only thing they control. They don't even really control food distributions because there's so many arbitrage and smuggling opportunities. They don't really get to decide who gets what food. I mean, they're trying, but they don't have control over that. So that's a way of saying that there is a possibility that you're going to have a big political change, but it's much more likely to come in a kind of Zimbabwe-like way from within the regime, from a figure within the regime saying this is unsustainable and we have to step in, than it is to come from uh, from a traditional opposition figure. Well, let me, I want to bring Meg into the conversation now. And Meg, when you were at Treasury and then on the IMF board, you dealt with a lot of pretty uh, tough cases, post-crisis resolution the like. Can you give us some sense here of what the official response is to what Francisco's laid out uh, now, uh, and not to anticipate, but if the answer is that uh, the official community is quite limited in terms of its engagement with this country positively, uh, then if there was a regime in place that had broad international support, give us also a little sense about what, how the international community would respond, what's really at stake here. Well, uh, given the situation, uh, first of all, thank you to the Bretton Woods Committee and uh, my two colleagues here uh, for pulling this together. Uh, I've really been struck, Francisco, listening to you about how really terrible the situation is. I mean, we see a lot in our, our press here, but uh, just the ability to live day to day to feed yourself is just remarkable how all consuming that becomes. And uh, as Rob pointed out, you know, the supply response is uh, basically withering away in the economy. So uh, I am surprised that it's managed to keep going, that somehow it still holds together and that there's been no ability for an opposition to coalesce or a real opposition, as you were just explaining, to really emerge and effectively uh, challenge the current administration. So given all that, 
uh, at the current time, I don't see any real ability for the international community to be much help to Venezuela because to give any kind of foreign aid, first of all, Venezuela isn't a low income country like we think of a, a Haiti after a hurricane getting that kind of humanitarian assistance. And even if food aid were delivered, how would it be distributed? Would the people who really need it get it from what you were just describing in terms of a lot of the smuggling, the corruption? So I just don't see that a lot of that is going to materialize. And of course, Venezuela's neighbors are very unhappy as well. I and mean, we have refugees in Brazil and Colombia. Mercosur has said, uh, thank you very much. You're suspended for the time being, given your behavior, anti-democratic principles in uh, Venezuela. So uh, I don't see any response right now, really, on the part of the international community and the burdens on the neighboring countries to deal with, uh, with uh, refugees. Uh, in terms of the role of the IMF or and major creditors, the G7, the G20, there really isn't much they can do right now, given that uh, Venezuela is really acting as an international pariah across the board in, in many different respects. And for that reason, it would take a major change in, I think, the role of the government, the leadership, uh, the role of the legislature before there could be any real response on the part of the international community. Uh, if that were to happen, let's say in, in 2018, whether it comes from internally within the regime, as uh, you were just discussing, or a real revolution, uh, which seems hard to imagine at this point, uh, then there's the ability, I think, of the international community to step in. And that's one thing the IMF does. A country asks for help, the IMF shows up. I mean, it shows up so long as it's got, it knows it has the support of its, its members, the creditor side of the IMF, the membership at large, because it doesn't really want to engage with the country, the staff and management, unless it's sure the IMF board will be supportive and will uh, approve any ultimate engagement. But even if that were to occur, it would take many, many months, if not a year, to actually put together any kind of a real program, any kind of economic assistance for Venezuela, because there are just so many different parts that would have to be put back together. Francisco pointed out how there haven't been uh, inflation statistics published, published in over a year. No one really knows what the hard data is in Venezuela. If it's being collected, if government workers are showing up, if they're doing the kind of surveys that put together a database. Um, you know, pretty much the only thing that seems to be widely reported is the oil production, which is uh, not a very uh, pretty picture either. So uh, it would take quite a long time to put together a real economic adjustment program. And in the end, that would entail difficult adjustment. I mean, hopefully there'd be a quick supply response if exchange rates could be unified, you know, in the parallel market go away. Uh, but that would still mean food prices, energy prices would be much higher than current official prices are in Venezuela. Now, if a supply response emerges over time, farmers come back to producing, they can get fertilizer, they can grow their crops, get seeds, and you see that supply response. If you see then foreign investors coming back in and putting the investment back into uh, the oil rigs, the supplies, then you'd see a very different situation. But there's a lot that would have to happen to get to that point. I mean, Venezuela has a huge set of arbitration claims against it, against PDVSA, uh, Chinese companies are suing their Venezuelan counterparts in U.S. courts for payment on supplies. Uh, we see the bondholders that are anxiously awaiting to see what's actually going to happen. Some payments get made occasionally. So before the IMF can put together a final package, it also has to have a sense of uh, what the financing will be, what the international financial support will be. And so we do have a very different situation in Venezuela than historically we've had as countries have approached the IMF and have approached their external creditors. In the past, countries would go to the Paris Club to get official credits rescheduled. They'd work with the IMF. They'd approach their uh, private sector creditors. And ultimately, things would be worked out. The uh, Paris Club would demand that the country seek comparable treatment, the same terms from its non-Paris Club creditors. In this case, the Paris Club group of creditors is really a very small part of Venezuelan, uh, the creditor base. We have uh, bondholders holding quite a um, significant amount, and we have newer official bilateral creditors, such as China, 
and Russia. Now, Russia is a member of the Paris Club, but went ahead and rescheduled some debts uh, without going, doing it through the Paris Club or insisting that Venezuela get an IMF program. Uh, China, we have uh, much less real hard information on in terms of what they're doing. We know they're extending some debts uh, that they tend to get, they get payments in uh, oil and they've allowed some of that to be uh, spaced out over time, reduced, taking reduced oil shipments. But, um, and again, not asking the IMF to uh, arrange a program, but of course the IMF can't arrange a program until Venezuela requests it. But given the very different constellation of creditors we now have in Venezuela and the traditional approach just is really not going to work easily in this case. And it'll be very difficult for the IMF to even go forward and bring a program to the board if it's not financed, because it'll need to know China, what are the total debts Venezuela owes to China? What are the maturities? Uh, what are you willing to do to stretch those out? Russia, other non-traditional creditors. And most of that has been very untransparent, non-transparent. So for Venezuela to reveal all that, for all the different Chinese entities, for example, that have extended loans to uh, Venezuela, will take quite a bit of time to put together and to get commitments, firm commitments that they will be, excuse me, they will be part of a, a financing package in the end. So I see this as being an incredibly difficult long-term process. Uh, we still don't know how the bondholders collectively are going to behave. I mean, a lot of the bonds, some of the bonds have collective action clauses, but not aggregation clauses. And so uh, it can be a real nightmare going through the courts and as well all the uh, the uh, corporate firms that have uh, arbitration claims. And even if they've written off different claims, they're still going to be coming back and, and seeking a redress once the situation has changed. So it'll be a very long time, I fear, one way or another. I mean, if Venezuela does change enough that the international community can come, it'll still take quite a while to turn things around. With that said, I do think a supply response could materialize pretty quickly if prices were liberalized, farmers got back to their fields, and the oil company could actually invest in its oil rigs and the foreign investors were willing to uh, take part in that. But uh, that's a lot of pieces that have to come together. And right now the world is in wait and see mode. Francisco, you have a two-handed uh, uh, comment on that? It, we, well, we have some breaking news. During the last three minutes, uh, the Osado Cabello at the uh, Constituent Assembly has just announced that the assembly will call for presidential elections ahead of April 30th. This just happened. Uh, but that would presumably be with restrictions on the, we're assuming restrictions on the op opposition parties without international monitoring of a, a, a credible nature. And so uh, un your view would be unlikely to, to, be, to command, cre be credible you know, with this international policy. Let's be very clear, this is not good news. Yesterday, this could be almost a trigger for uh, a negative policy response, not a, a reason to liberalize, it seems to me, right? Yesterday, when the European Union announced uh, individual sanctions against, uh, I think, eight regime figures, including Diosado, the very powerful Diosado Cabello, uh, Cabello and the government announced that this was a shot to the heart of the dialogue that, and the negotiations that the government was carrying out with the opposition to agree elections conditions for this year. What they are doing is they're saying, okay, if you're going to keep sanctioning us, we're going to have elections on our rules. That means that we're going to control who gets on the ballot. There will very likely not be any credible international monitoring. We might have a mission from Iran or Belarus or Cuba, but, but no truly independent monitors. Uh, we'll get to control who's on the ballot. We'll get to control the entire electoral board. We'll get to control all the election site and we'll get to control all the advertising. So this is as near to an announcement that we're going to steal this election um, as we're likely to get. Meg, let me come back to you on the, and push you just a little bit on, on the scenario you laid out, because you described the IMF doing it right in some sense, getting the, to get the information they need to align a, a sufficient amount of other creditors to, that a program was adequately financed and would meet their high standard for credit, creditworthiness could take a long time. 
and yet the suffering is profound, and the pressures, as we've seen in these post-crisis cases, intense on the international community to get going. Can we talk a little bit about maybe the capacity to, to accelerate, to move more quickly in terms of offering something to the people of Venezuela in this scenario? The fund has a so-called rapid financing instrument, which is non-conditional, can get a little bit of money out. I think in this case, 1.9 billion is what they'd be limited to. Uh, you know, they could, there's been some speculation they could move maybe forward with a program more quickly, you know, even recognizing huge risks in moving forward and uncertainties in the financing. Um, you know, how much capacity does the fund have? And, and of course, there's other creditors too. The World Bank would be presumably wanting to come back in, although they have the same issue that the fund has, that they haven't been engaged for a long time. Uh, the IDB could be an important actor here, although they have constraints on their capital and would, there would be a political ask associated, I presume, with their involvement. But how do you, if the pressures are profound for the international community to do something to help alleviate this crisis, um, how much give is there? How much capacity is there to kind of bend the rules and move more quickly? Well, uh, <clears throat> Rob, that's a good question. And I say, uh, you know, it's in the hands of the IMF membership. Now, the reality is after the European crisis and the loans to the European countries, Eurozone member countries, uh, the IMF has really toughened up its rules in terms of how it gives uh, large access programs. So uh, I think it would be pretty tough to push the envelope in terms of the access levels for Venezuela, given that uh, it won't, you really need, the IMF needs to be able to ascertain that either the debt is sustainable, or if it's not totally sure it's sustainable, that there's enough uh, foreign commitments, you know, creditor commitments that the IMF will be repaid over time. So that's why I don't really see a huge IMF program uh, in the works. Now you're right, there is the rapid financing arrangement, but that's not very much money and it pales in comparison to the huge needs of Venezuela. Now, one possibility is if um, bilateral governments or central banks are willing to do, uh, I find it hard to imagine actual bridge loans, you know, central bank kinds of facilities, which are really meant to bolster foreign exchange reserves and not to be spent, uh, which in Venezuela's case, they're going to want to uh, spend them. They'll need the money for critical imports. But um, in terms of the IMF moving quickly, you still need in terms of uh, being able to bring a program to the board, you've got to have numbers, you've got to have a sense of what the adjustment program will be, what the country can commit to. The IMF will insist on prior actions. That means that the uh, country actually implements measures and the IMF can see that they're implemented before they'll ask the executive board to vote on something and that the um, creditors are somewhat willing to engage and that there's a good prospect that there will be an orderly, eventual, sufficient workout. So that's why I think it'll be so very difficult to bring all that together. And for the international community to then decide the situation in Venezuela is so dire, let's use the IMF as an aid agency. I really don't quite see that happening given how important Many countries feel the IMF is to you know global financial stability, and of course Venezuela, as terrible as the situation is in the country, is not really a threat to the to the global economy, the global financial system. So uh, I don't mean to dash your hopes, but um, it would take a, a really major change on the part of Venezuela, a real uh, shift in all bilateral partners, neighbors' willingness to help out in all sorts of ways before I think the IMF could possibly commit to anything sizable or speedy without having enough information, uh, data nailed down and commitments to be able now to- Now we forward. think about those programs where there was that extraordinary response. Of course, most recently Ukraine was a good example where they moved pretty quickly and got to the board with a program that was higher risk than they were comfortable with given Ukraine's history, but uh, appropriate given the situation. But if you think back to the major international bailouts, to use the phrase, you know, whether it's the Mexico the 80s and the 90s, uh, Korea 97, Ukraine was a recent one, many of them, the U.S. government played an extraordinarily central role in mobilizing uh, resources, bringing all the major creditors together, sometimes twisting arms to make the package work. How 
but we have a different government here with different a different U.S. administration now with different views about multilater multilateralism and past administrations, Republican and Democrat. So in your base case scenario, Meg, um, two part question. One is what role do you think the U.S. government should be playing and what role do you think they would be playing in terms of supporting the IMF and trying to mobilize this extraordinary financial uh, need here? Well, if the if the situation in Venezuela were to change dramatically and have real elections and a real change in the political leadership, I think the U.S. government would want to be supportive. Um, I doubt that would mean a lot of bilateral lending. Uh, if things were working out, XM could go back and cover those sorts of things. But um, you know, I think the U.S. would be willing to work with other countries in the IMF to try and encourage a package be put together. But recall what I said earlier, um, because the U.S., the G7, you know, Japan and the Europeans, Canada are not major creditors, bilateral creditors, it's not really in their hands how a package is going to be put together. We've got China, we've got Russia, and we've got this very dispersed universe, we don't know how dispersed, how diverse, universe of bondholders around the world, how to get a sense of what they're willing to commit to as well as all the uh, the other private sector players with arbitration claims, I think it'll be very difficult to bring everybody into a room together and decide. Now, typically that's the IMF and we'd have informal board meetings to discuss a touchy case. Uh, and we'd all come in and really feel pretty confident on what our governments were willing to commit, willing to support, and then the IMF could move forward. But with still such big gaps out there and without a lot more transparency and willingness on the part of some of these other creditors, other players, and some sense of where the bondholders collectively are going to be, it'll be very tough for the U.S. to play that central role, even if it's willing to. And that, and that I'm not sure about. But I think if there was a major political change and other countries in the region are much more willing to support Venezuela wanting to be helpful, then perhaps there can be some influence on this administration and we might see that kind of leadership emerge. And then uh, an issue we've talked about in the past and something I spend a lot of time on, which is thinking about what a debt restructuring ultimately might look like in the context of the funds rules. As you know, we've had new rules put in place recently on, on debt restructuring and terms and conditions of it. Uh, what in gen how in general, can you say anything about how you think the fund, obviously it depends on all these uncertainties yet to be resolved, but any thoughts on how the IMF would look at debt restructuring in this context? It's a kind of complicated one because creditors will understandably set, look at the vast resource base of this country, uh, how productive and wealthy it was when it was under effective management and say, this is not a country that needs long-term debt relief. Uh, but yet, obviously, the situation on the ground, its capacity to pay at this point, uh, both political and economic, would seem to argue that there'd be relatively limited capacity to, to pay on debt for uh, some long time. So uh, can you give us any sense about how the fund would look at debt, how they might guide that type of restructuring, how well, it might be different or similar to past, to past deals? I think that you really hit it on the head in terms of how complicated this is going to be, because I totally agree with you. As I said earlier, I do think a supply response could be pretty quick. And of course, that might make creditors reluctant to do any kind of long-term uh, restructuring. With that said, there are shorter term options creditors could use, You know, do a little bit of a, a not payment holiday, but basically a, a shorter term window for Venezuela to get its feet back on the ground, you know, two or three years of significantly reduced payments and then schedule the higher payments up, extend maturities just a little bit. Uh, things like that would be possible that would give some sense of, okay, the creditors then will participate when the supply response does materialize. But in the meantime, they're helping out Venezuela so that it can get to that supply response. Uh, are the creditors going to be willing to do that? The bondholders willing to do that? Uh, that's a really good question. China, Russia, other major creditors, would they be willing to do it? Uh, probably. Uh, I think in the end, they'd be happy if uh, Venezuela had an IMF program and the domestic policies were changing. So uh, in that respect, I think you could get uh, 
uh, IMF membership on board. But the, the key question is, would that private sector creditor base be willing to do that, provide that window of a couple of years for Venezuela to get its feet back on the ground? So it would be a, a little bit different than some of these others that we've gone through where it was clear a country needed a long-term uh, resolution of its uh, debt problem. Okay, I think this would probably be a good time to open it up and begin to take um, some questions from the audience if uh, if people have them. Um, so uh, Casey, are you, you wanna take back over and um, tell people what to do? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Just a reminder to our audience that if you have a question, to please type it in to the questions box. We do have a question from Alejandro Gutierrez. Alejandro, if you would just enable your mic and then you can pose your question. Hi. Um, my question is about the, the, you know, some statements that have been made in the last few months um, uh, by the National Assembly about how they did not authorize a lot of this new debt that the Venezuelan government has incurred with Russia and China and uh, I'm not exactly sure with, with whom, but with some uh, international creditors. And they, they've said that, you know, since that debt was not approved by the, by the National Assembly, by the Congress, uh, it's really not legitimate. And that whenever the government changes, whenever that happens, they will not uh, necessarily, um, you know, honor that. And, you know, do you foresee if that happens, and that's a big if, would that have any impact on any of this discussion of, uh, you know, IMF intervention and, you know, negotiating with creditors? Does that play any role at all? Great question. Um, probably all of us have something to say on it. Who wants to go first? Meg, did you want to, or do you? Yeah, um, that's, that's going to be a real, a bit of a conundrum because, of course, to have a debt deal, uh, on any particular bond issue or uh, other loan or trade agreement or whatever, you do need the government to sign on to it. So uh, if you have a new government, they're not going to sign on to it. I think the problem would be it would have an adverse impact on the ability of the government to deal with other debts that they might view as legitimate. So I think in the end, the market, the reaction would force them back into basically accepting, accepting that universe and and uh, seeking to negotiate all of it on uh, comparable terms. But uh, I'll leave it to some of the, uh, the other two experts for their views as well. Francisco? Sure. Um, I think it's important to understand that the posture the National Assembly uh, adopted was more about dissuading creditors from extending new debts. And it was successful. I mean, partially, it was one of 72 very good reasons why creditors have been unwilling to extend new credit over the last couple of years. All of the new credit that has happened since 2015 has been in the form of uh, repo deals, which are basically like pawn shop deals where the Republic or PDVSA gives over ownership of assets against a loan and then agrees to repurchase, repurchase those assets. So in a way, you know, you already handed off the collateral. So, you know, it was, it was meant to dissuade credit deals and it's already happened, but there, it's not like there's a lot of debt out there that has been contracted in contravention. Yeah. To, to this agreement. So I, I, let, me, let me jump in on it because obviously there's been a, a broader debate over uh, this, the idea that some debt can be ruled illegitimate. Uh, some of our, our friends like Anna Gelpern have written on this concept and certainly there are those that argue that this would be the place to test that kind of hypothesis. Uh, it's also worth pointing to build on Francisco's point that, you know, we have this extraordinary mass of debt. Some have estimated that when the IMF were to arrive, they would see about two up to $200 billion in debt. Uh, if you include the, what's going to likely to come out of the financial sector, the official credit, things we just don't know about. It, that may be high, but uh, if it's 150 even, only about 60 of that is the bonded debt. And we have this extraordinary uh, continuum, in a sense, of uh debt and debt-like instruments out there. And many people think that those claims give them some seniority. Uh, certainly, for example, an energy supply company that has a large amount of debt may feel that because they're central to any, any supply response of the sort that Meg's described, they should be treated preferentially. Problem is everybody can't be senior. Uh, 
uh, and we can't make everything junior. I think a really interesting public policy question will be when you start to talk about restructuring, how much do you put in the main restructuring bucket? How much is addressed in the sense in the common set of terms and restructuring? How much is dealt with individually or elsewhere? And I think I'm agreeing with what Meg was pointing to, which is there's going to be tremendous pressure uh, on the official sector, which will want to provide adequate financing, that will want to minimize intercredit or equity disputes and challenges and litigation, that that pressure should tend, at least if I were advising them, to want to throw that net as wide as possible to get China to go along on comparable terms outside the Paris Club yet, yes, but uh, in a way that gives a sense that we basically are trying to diminish uh, the, uh, the, the sort of debates over rank ordering. Now, in that context, the National Assembly will want to say these bonds were illegitimate or this debt wasn't approved by us. And certainly that's important now in terms of limiting new finance to this government. But uh, I do think there should be, there probably will be substantial pressures on a new government to moderate those pressures and to basically try and get a comprehensive restructuring that spreads the pain out as broadly as possible. That's still at the political call uh, to be made and it will be essential to the, the ultimate debt restructuring and how it goes, I think. Are there other questions? Uh, yes. Um our next question is from Mr. Otto Habeck. Uh, Mr. Habeck, you can pose your question. Hi, thank you very much for the conference. I'm just curious, everything that I've heard has, has been very theoretical because unless we see real change in terms of the government and their attitude towards, I guess, you know, the, econ the global economy and the, and the other countries, we're not gonna be able to really find out what the next steps are. But I'm curious one thing, which you know is currently on the minds of a lot of people. Um, Venezuela recently announced, from what I saw, that they're looking at creating a digital currency. And I'd like to have your thoughts on what reality there is to that being able to address any of the problems that you've just you know mentioned. Francisco, tell us, is the Petro the solution to all of Venezuela's problems? The Petro is a sign of desperation, first and foremost. The Petro is them trying to raise finance in a situation where nobody will lend to them and thinking that maybe if they piggyback onto this Bitcoin uh, hype craze, um, they can scrounge up a few hundred million dollars here or there from creditors outside uh, the traditional major credit centers, maybe some Russians, maybe get some black money um, that, that wouldn't pass uh, traditional sort of anti-money laundering checks. Um, it's a sideshow and a sign of desperation. Yeah, well, Meg, did you? Uh, we want Meg. Can we yeah, have to? I, I did see something where. Thanks. I did see something where the government disowned that I, idea, that white paper. I don't know if that's that's correct, but I also think uh, pretty much anyone on the other side is going to realize that uh, this would be backed by collateral that's already been pledged to many other, uh, many other uh, outside obligations. So I'm not sure that it really yeah. uh, would Well, I even, go, I even go a little further, having looked at these draft regulations a bit on this. You know, they, they talk about it as a way of evading sanctions, creating a new alternative currency, and everybody thinks, wants to talk about blockchains and cryptocurrencies. But this would be subject to domestic law. There's no clear link to the underlying resources. The conversion would have to be at the official rate, so I see this as having really no practical importance internationally. Now, they did talk about doing some sort of international placement. But the U.S. Treasury uh, last week, and rightly in my view, uh, put out an, an, an FAQ basically saying this would be an extension of credit and subject to the sanctions. Good for them, but it also means that this is unlikely to find international acceptance. I could imagine the government still sort of doing it as a show a little bit, but I think I'm with Francisco in saying what this really is, is an effort in the context of hyperinflation to create an alternative kind of almost soft cur a, a currency that has the appeal of being like a currency board, being having some soft backing, but in reality is just another way to issue claims in, in lieu of, of real resources for payment. And I, my expectation is it's going to be very rapidly depreciated, but it is a one-off effort to create an inflation tax and to create some resources for the government. But uh, 
and certainly no reason why the new, a new government down the road would have to honor those uh, claims. So I'm deeply skeptical, as I think the others are, about uh, whether this is going to be practical in any meaning sense, meaningful sense. Any other questions? Uh, yes, we do have a question. Um, this person does not have a microphone, so I'm going to read it. It's from Whitney Debevois. If and when power changes hands, won't there be a humanitarian crisis that will require a response faster than a traditional IMF program with financing assurances? Well, Meg, this is uh, to our earlier comment, I, conversation. I, no, I would, I would agree that there, I think there might be a humanitarian response, and the question is, how much in terms of resources, food, and how would it be distributed, uh, I think could materialize, but um, again, it'll be difficult for countries to pour in the kind of billions of aid that would probably be needed to, uh, to get things going again. So uh, yes, I think there could easily be a response of food aid, that sort of thing, uh, but there's much else that's needed, the medicine, the all the uh, materials needed to uh, restore production, the farm inputs, whether it's seeds or fertilizer. So, uh, and I just don't quite see all of that being uh, Whitney, I wish we had him on, we had him online because he's a veteran of uh, many of the most important debt restructuring and rescue cases uh, that we've had to deal with. Um, so the question should go to him. But um, uh, on the humanitarian point, I absolutely agree. I think there'll be immense pressure to move. In, and if this were a kind of a, a very poor country coming out of, say, a, a, you know, a civil war or after a long period of, of stress, you know, the, the major uh, agencies, aid agencies, would have experience in the country and would be ready to jump in from the UK, Japan, the Netherlands, these kind, of, these kind of major aid agencies, they don't know Venezuela, right? It wasn't one of their clients, and this is a problem. And as I said earlier, the, the, the MDBs don't have the pipeline in, many, in most cases to do it. I, I think it's critical. Uh, I think you're going to have to have some sort of friends of Venezuela, perhaps led by a Colombia or a Brazil, that mobilizes and helps generate border on the border relief. I think there's going to we're going to have to stretch, and I actually think the fund may have to go forward with a, a, a small program, kind of a regular SBA, not subject to exceptional access, even under extraordinary risk and fudging a little bit how they explain it to try and get some more money out and mobilize. I also think it means that the U.S. government, you know, if I wish the U.S. or I hope the U.S. government could even now be talking to those agencies and trying to talk about scenarios and mobilizing response. I know it's not something that's uh, maybe natural for this administration in terms of its broader views on, uh, on, the, on the role of the global agencies, but I think there is a real void that could be filled uh, to, to, to prepare now for what is this going to be extraordinary humanitarian uh, uh, challenge. I don't know. Uh, can, I just jump in on, can I jump in on this? Um, I think it's actually wrong to focus on this humanitarian aspect from a humanitarian point of view. What I mean is that this is really about security. Late last year, Colombia had to send a group of civil defense planners on a fact-finding mission to the southern border of Turkey uh, to see how you cope when 600,000 refugees turn up at your border. What do you do? What do you do? Nobody in Colombia knows how to do that. And both people massing onto Curaçao and Aruba, you have the northern state of Guaraima under a health emergency in Brazil because they cannot cope with the number of Venezuelans. So there's a security aspect to if you have, because we're really looking at state collapse. If you have a situation where nobody who works for a state goes to work, the state collapses, and you have hundreds of thousands of refugees, now you have an ungoverned space in Northern Latin America within a very short distance of the United States. Did you know that the Venezuelan Armed Forces bought nearly 6,000 shoulder-mounted surface-to-air missiles over the last few years from Russia? You have five, 6,000 man pads um, floating around in a space that is not really go being governed. This is a security question. Like the reason there will be, you, they may call it a humanitarian response, but the reason there will have to be a rapid response to this is that you have 
established drug trafficking routes from Northern South America to the United States and to Europe through West Africa that already, they already know how to, uh, how to ship cocaine to these places. You have a Hezbollah presence in Eastern Venezuela. And that, you know, how easy is it to just hide some man pads under a sack of cocaine and ship it north? The reason that there will have to be a response will be that there is a serious security problem if you have a large country in Northern South America within a three hour flight of the United States uh, and with established trafficking routes that's ungoverned. Oh, thank you. I was just We're going to going. add. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think, um, of, of course, Treasury staff are looking at the numbers, trying to figure out how bad it is and what would be needed in the short term, the medium term, making guesses as to, in terms of what creditors might be or might not be willing to do. And I'm sure IMF staff are doing the same thing. I don't think there's much by way of discussion among countries or. In terms, of, uh, in terms of what they might be willing to do because no one's going to want to send any signal that they're going to be supporting the current Venezuelan government. They don't want to be misunderstood. So I just don't see that there's anything major in terms of anticipatory coordination going on. With that said, I think individually, different institutions, whether it's the Treasury, I'm sure the Fed is looking at it for any impact there might be, uh, the IMF, I'm sure the World Bank is as well, but as we know, the World Bank can't usually respond very quickly as you yeah. So I, 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 I think I think we have time for one more question. Or I want to be a good moderator and, and, and get and conclude on time. Do we have any other, any further questions? I, then I'm going to throw one back to you because it, the security angle is really interesting to me in the following sense. If I look at, you know, I've sort of been fascinated by the fact that sanctions have become such an important part of U.S. policy generally. I've referred to it as the, the new Swiss Army knife of U.S. foreign policy with a with a with an attachment for every issue. And certainly, sanctions have been a core part of the U.S. policy response to now. And I think very much in line with what Francisco is saying. What's interesting and a little different from some other cases I've studied is the way in which national security considerations and narco-terrorism concerns, and if there were some sort of failed state space, had very much animated concerns uh, in the White House, it seems, in terms of how we look at this country. So it does tie into how important is this sort of con security concern, or maybe even putting it more directly, because I know a lot of investors are looking at the sanctions now. Do you think that there will be say in the next two to three months, additional sanctions put in place, the same or less? And we're, we're, how do you see the role of sanctions in this environment? Maybe the both of you. Meg first. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, given how dire the situation is, sanctions, I mean, the administration could sanction more individuals, I suppose, but basically I don't think there are any financial institutions that are that uh, interested in dealing with senior Venezuelan officials right now anyway, whether or not they're sanctioned. So I'm not sure that going that route will have much of an additional impact and sanctioning the overall economy is, uh, is a little bit difficult um, given the, the oil that uh, the U.S. still imports. So I, um, I don't see a major change in the approach on sanctions, but uh, I have been surprised again and again, or maybe I'm less surprised now at how, how frequently the U.S. government does turn to that too. Francisco, obviously the the other the way there the two stories that are being talked about are oil sanctions, more comprehensive, or secondary sanctions on financial flows, including on the elites. Should they? Will you know, what's the thinking? Uh, uh, it's kicking, it's kicking a very nearly dead horse even further. I mean, the, the Venezuelan energy industry doesn't work as it is. Um, we've seen what's happening to production. We've seen Halliburton and Schleberger just uh, write off uh, over almost $2 billion, if I saw correctly, of, of debts owed to them. So um, I also think that sort of like the Petro, that the sanctions are a little bit of a sign of a desperation, the sign of politicians and political figures in, in Washington and in Europe be feeling under pressure to do something and to be seen to have done something, but that's not what the strategic question is right now. It's more a signal, anyways. At our witching hour, 
So maybe let me ask each of you to very briefly, if there's something that we haven't talked about something, whether it's an investor or policymaker or just interested observers should know that they don't know, and then any concluding remarks you have. Um, let me start first with Francisco. Okay, very briefly, I think the scenario that we should be aware of in the coming, uh, in the coming months is a scenario where somebody inside the regime decides we need to step in because hyperinflation is uh, so devastating and so unsustainable. So they step in, but suddenly having grabbed power from the Maduro, the clique around Maduro that doesn't understand the need for reform at all, they will need to broaden A, their fiscal base, and they'll be looking to the IMF for sure for that, but also their political base. And they'll probably come under a lot of pressure to make a deal with the opposition and the National Assembly. And that, that is sort of the opposition's back way route into relevance on, on this. They cannot really dislodge the regime, but they can regain relevance if whichever aspect or player within the regime pushes Maduro aside suddenly needs a broader base. At that point, there will have to be a negotiation with the IMF and with the United States. And at that point, um, we will very much hope that the US and the IMF understands that they need to move quickly because it will certainly will take six months just to get the national accounts worked out because nobody keeps these national accounts right now. Um, those are six months where a period of chaos could tip Venezuela into a kind of Somalia-like situation. We, don't, we can't wait those six months. I don't know what the answer to that question is, yeah, but I, that kind of should be more in mind. I think it is something a lot of people don't have on their radar and should. Meg, you get the last word. Yeah, it's, I mean, a scenario like that makes it really difficult then for like, the U.S. other countries to figure out their response. Is this person truly different? Is the political situation changing? Will it be more democratic? Uh, so that may take some time to assess as well, looking for different uh, indications on that. Uh, so that may add to the hesitation. I mean, it's just very difficult, but uh, I share your concern about the utter chaos and uh, disasters that are unfolding day by day and could in fact get much worse. So, uh, um, I mean, we all do feel for the Venezuelan people, but uh, it's very difficult to find a way forward out of this. Well, with that, we, we on that happy note, um, I want to thank both our speakers. It's been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. Uh, as I said, I don't know if it's made me uh, it made me uh, less more or less concerned, but I think we we have underscored just how important this case is, not just for Venezuelans, but for the world at large, and how much uh, is at stake in coming months. So uh, hopefully, it's been useful to leaders, to listeners. Thank you very much for uh, for dialing in. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so that will conclude our regional spotlight, Venezuela on the Brink, IMF to the rescue. Thank you all for attending, and a special thanks to our speakers, Francisco Toro, Meg Lunsinger, and Robert Khan for your insightful thoughts and candid dialogue. A recording of today's virtual conference will be posted on our website, brettonwoods.org, and you will also receive a follow-up email with, within the next 24 hours that contains a link to the event recording as well. On behalf of the entire Bretton Woods Committee, thank you for joining us today.